Hi, I am Andrew Chin. This talk is about universal quantification and implication in mini Karen. This is a joint work with Gregory Rosenblatt, Matthew Mike, and Lisa Zhang. This work is adding two new goal constructors, universal quantifier and implication, into mini Karen in a way that works well with our pre existing primitive constraints and the recursive relation. These are the two new goal constructors that we introduce. For the universal quantifiers, the full goal has three components that specify logic variables, the body, and the domain restriction. Domain is specified as a goal. Here, we use an empty parenthesis to indicate that we have no restriction on V, and thus, V can be anything. Here, this query asks whether for all the V on the whole domain, if all the V equals to themselves. For the implication, it is a goal constructor with two components, antecedent goal and consequent goals. This query asks whether a equals 3 implies a not equal to 4. The motivation of these two new goal constructors is that they can serve as a step towards synthesizing programs from specification using universal quantifiers and implication. For example, we want to synthesize a sorting function. We can do that in two ways. In the first approach, we query for a program that for every list as input, the value on the program applies to the input can lead to a sorted version of the input. Then, if the query can be run successfully, the resulting program is the sorted sorting function. Note that the exists keyword is just an alias of the fresh keyword. In the second approach, we query the proposition that there is a permuted and sorted list L2 corresponding to every given list L. On the curry howard correspondence, the proof term for this proposition is a program that does the sorting. Sadly, both synthesizing tasks are currently impractical due to the performance. Then, what can be done? Let's start with something simple. In the first example, we query for two logical variables, a and b, such that for every value in the domain, the value is either equal to a or not equal to b. Our system can successfully retrieve a solution a equals b. To understand how our system solved this query under the hood, we will first illustrate the sketch of the algorithm, and after that, we will trace this example manually. These are the four main components of our, our algorithm. The first step serves as a base case. It checks if the domain can be satisfied at all. If not, then the for all goal is vacuously true. Second, if the domain is satisfiable, then we need to check if there's any V at all that can satisfy the goal. We call this step candidate extraction. We do this by directly running the body and consider the quantified variable as existential variable. If we don't get any result back, we know that the for all goal fails. However, if we do get a state back, then the returning state describes the value of Vs on which the goal succeeds. But what about the rest of Vs? The key insight of this third step is that we can derive a goal that describes the rest of V. We call this new goal relative complement of a state. Once we have this goal, we can run a modified for all goal with this restricted domain and thus recursion back to step one. Graphically, we use this L box to represent the space of possible values of V. The state we get from candidate extraction tells us the subset of the domain where the goal holds. The relative complement is a goal representing this blue area. We will show a concrete example in the next few slides. Finally, another way to satisfy this for all goal that isn't covered by step 1, 2, 3 is that sometimes we can falsify the domain by cleverly setting our logic variables. For example, this for all v b equals to a v not equal to b goal can succeed vacuously by setting a equals to b. This is called relative negation in the paper, and we won't go into details in the talk about it. Now, let's compute this example, where we query for a and b such that for every value on the domain, the value is either equal to a or not equal to b. Starting at step 1, the domain is clearly not vacuous, so we have more work to do. Going to step 2, we check if there is some v for which the body goal holds. It turns out yes, and we could potentially get two states back. And let's say the first resulting state is v not equal to b. Then in step three, we check if the goal holds for the remaining part of v, or in other words, any v for which v not equal to b is not true. That is, the goal v equals to b. Thus, we run another for goal, but this time with the restricted domain v equals to b. Notice that we will run this new for all goal with a modified state from step two. We will only keep the information on the logic variables outside of the for all goal in the new state. In this example, we will have an empty state.
Now, we try to solve this new for all goal using empty state. Step 1 and step 2 is done in a fa similar fashion as the last recursion. After step 2, we get a state conjunction v equals to b v equals to a as the final state. However, on step 3, the other choices of b will be different. This time, it's not simply a negation of the given state from step 2, since this state also has the equality information between a and b. The remaining part of v should also have this information. Thus, the new for all domain is the old domain conjuncted with the new relative complement that also includes the information a equals to b. What's more, for this new for all goal, we still run with the modified state from step 2. This time, after restricting the information into a and b, we get the state a equals to b. Now, looking at this new domain, it's actually unsatisfiable and will fail in the step 1 of the next iteration. Thus, we get a solution a equals to b. This is the end of our example. This delicately designed algorithm seems kind of ad hoc, but it is actually generated from this given proposition. The full details of the proof is in the paper. Now, let's shift our focus to implication. An implication goal has two components, the antecedent goal and the consequent goal. In this example, we query whether a equals 3 implies a not equal to 4. <coughs> to solve an implication goal, we use a combination of semantic solving and syntactic solving. We use semantic solving when the antecedent goal can be easily negated, and so we can rewrite the implication into a disjunction. Then we can reuse Minikaran's existing facility to solve this disjunction. The queries that can be purely solved by semantic solving is a goal that only consists of primitive constraints. Primitive constraints are the equalities, inequalities, and the type constraints, and thus negatable. In this example, a equals 3 is a primitive constraint, and thus semantic solving can alter the implication into a disjunction. While syntactic solving can be roughly considered as purely doing syntactic pattern matching, so it is used for reasoning about user-defined relations. In this example, when we assume evaluate 3, if we want to re resolve evaluate b, we will unify b with 3. Thus, for an implication goal with both primitive constraint and user-defined relation inside the antecedent, we need to combine these two approaches. To achieve a working algorithm combining these two, we need to take care of the following things. First, we need to accompany the solving computation with a list of goals, indicating the current assumptions so that when a target goal is a user-defined relation, we can invoke a computation to do pattern matching. For people who are familiar with Minikaran internals, we should essentially change the interface of pause function, allowing it to take a new parameter, assumptions. Second, we will ex we'll extract user-defined relations in the antecedent into the assumption data structure. Third, we extract primitive constraints into the state instead of putting them into the assumption data structures because pattern matching on them won't be fruitful. Here we trace this small example. We use an arbitrary user-defined relation row and omit its definition. Currently, we don't need the definition and you will see the reason later. This query asks if we assume that both a equals 1 and row a5 are true, whether that implies row a b. To extract as many primitive constraints as possible into the state, we partition the antecedent into a conjunction of two parts. We make sure the first part is full of primitive constraints. Thus, it is possible that the first part will be vacuously empty. Then we will have the first part as trivial goal top. In our example, the first part is a equals 1, and the second part is row a5. After we find out the two parts, then we invoke three ways to solve the implication. The first two streams tries to falsify the antecedent. The third stream is really solving the goal. Because the first part contains only primitive constraints, taking negation on it is possible. In our example, the first stream is the goal a not equals to 1. Because the second part is not, not easily negatable, so we conjunct with the information assuming that the first part already holds, and then use implication in the failure goal bottom to falsify the second part of the antecedent. The third stream is the one really does the solving, thus it's only different from the second stream in the consequent goal, row AB. This is the big picture of our algorithm. 
In our example, the first string a not equal to 1 is directly solved by using the original mini Karen facility. This is a part of the semantic solving in this blue graph and pointed out here. The highlight plus is the part doing partition of the three strings from the last slide, and this is also a part of semantic solving. However, to really solve the second and the third strings, we need the syntactic solving, which is the green part. Now, we look at how our syntactic solving is dealing with the third string. In the third string, we will directly solve first conjunct by semantic solving, and thus incorporate the information of a equals to 1 into the state. Then, we put row A5 into the assumption. At this stage, we can choose to use pattern matching between row A5 and row AB and directly unify B with 5 to get one solution. Note that, notice that, in this example, we don't actually have to look at the definition for row at all, but this is not always the case. Let's look at another example where pattern matching is not enough, and we need to know and unfold the definitions of the user-defined relations. In this example, foo and bar are defined recursively. Foo z is defined as simply expanding to foo counts 1 z, and bar z is defined as foo z. If we don't look at the relation definitions at all, we are stuck here. So instead, we try to unfold the antecedent and consequent one time. We will get implies foo counts 1 to foo counts x to. Then, pattern matching will easily figure out a solution that maps x to 1. Now, we run some examples in our system. The first series of examples are doing some simple proving. Our system is able to prove or disapprove some simple queries about universal quantifiers and implication with the appearances of logic variables. The first query is looking for a Q such that all value in the middle of the domain is not equal to that Q. We expect this query has no solution. In the second example, we query for two logic variables, A and B, such that for every value in the domain, the value is equal to either equal to a or not equal to b. This example is returning one solution. Every solution will have two parts. Here, the first part of the solution is indicating the value of the query a and b are equal to each other. The second part is a single top, indicating we have no extra constraints. In this example, we query for q such that q is not equal to any pair of 1 and an arbitrary x. This is a good example showing how the extra constraint looks like. This query is returning four solutions. Here, for each solution, we have an extra constraint. The first solution saying, an, saying any number, symbol, or string is not equal to that pair. And the third solution saying that if the first element is not 1, then any pair is not equal to that pair. In the above three examples, our system successfully proved some queries reasoning about primitive constraints, pairs, and universal quantifiers. Now, let's look at the second group of examples, graph reachability and game winning. These examples are from constructive negation by Evgeny Moisenko from two years ago. We find the graph reachability example very helpful to illustrate using implication in the bottom to encode negation in our system. Here, we use this edge relation to encode the graph information. The graph has four nodes, A, B, C, D, and four edges. We define reachability as usual and define unreachability by negating reachability relation. We use implication and a failure go bottom to encode negation. Now we can run some simple queries about the graph. The first query is asking for a node that is unreachable from C. The returning answer is saying as long as the node is not COD, it is unreachable from C. That means A and B are the nodes unreachable from C. Here, we will have an inequality constraint instead of equality constraint in the solution because we didn't restrict the domain of the nodes into A, B, C, D. The second query is asking for a node that cannot reach C. Here, our solution says D cannot reach C. We also adopt the game winning examples from the same paper. The example is interesting because it defines a recursive relation that interplays with negation. We use the same directed graph here, but here we define a game on this graph. Each node of the graph can be either a winning node or a losing node. If one node has zero fan out, then it's a losing node. And nodes with, ex with edges pointing to a losing node is a winning node. This is how we define winning relation. Winning requires the existence of a lo losing adjacent node. Compared to how the paper requires an 
extra annotation and stratification when negation is applied to a recursive relation. Here, mm -hmm. we don't have such syntactic restriction. This gives us a better user interface. We can query whether C is a winning node and if D is a winning node. However, we don't expect winning A or winning B can succeed or even halt. These two queries don't halt simply because the game doesn't specify them. We know in this graph D is a losing node and thus C is a winning node, but this game doesn't tell us a node without any adjacent losing node is whether winning or losing. Computationally, we cannot conclude anything here. However, if we assume A is a losing node, then we can conclude B is a winning node. This serves as an interesting example from using implication. The series of examples are all about sorting. Sorting is a basic synthesizing task. However, we cannot really synthesize anything about sorting in the current stage. Our system can only try to prove some basic property. We will make a simple relational insertion sort for booleans. This insertion sort, while well, given a list, while we'll try to lift all the faults in the front. Notice that all our query here will work on lists of fixed lengths. The reason is that we don't have induction reasoning in our system yet to handle lists of arbitrary lengths. It's the best we can do now. This first query is asking whether a list ending with false will sort to the same thing. We know it is not true when x is actually true. The second query is asking whether the negation of the above is true. It should be. We can notice that with just a simple negation, there will be an exaggerated time difference. This difference will be excessively amplified when we are dealing with lists of length 3 or 4. For those cases, the query won't finish, won't finish in 30 seconds. The good thing is that we still can run some of the following simple queries. These two queries are asking whether are asking the similar things as the above two, but with lists of different lengths and content. Now we show the classical mini current example, the relational interpreter Evalo. In this example, we want to show our system can reason about potentially non-terminating program. This is an interpreter for simple Lisp. Variables in this language are represented namelessly using the Brown indices. Then we encode the classical omega function in this untyped language. This IDF is exactly the identity function. Now, in this example, we use implication to encode a false assumption that the unhalting omega can evaluate it to the identity function. Doing so, evaluate on omega can halt and give identity function back as a final result. Because the only possible terminating routine is to rewrite the result of the value on omega into identity function, it is unsurprising to see all four solutions are identity function as result. The final examples are about constructivity. Our system is using constructive reasoning because first, all of the primitive constraints are decidable, and second, the disjunction is reasoned by proving at least one of the branch. Finally, we can consider the implication as constructing a new proof given an old proof from the assumption that is a lambda term. This looks exactly like BHK interpretation. Now we define two new relations, a dead loop relation and a Hauter relation. A Hauter relation is asking if the value of a given expression ends up with some value. That means the given expression will halt. Let's see what we can do about this user-defined relation. A good example is the law of the excluded middle, LEM. LEM is generally not provable in intuitionistic logic. The first query is asking if for arbitrary x, disjunction of negation of loop x and loop x hold. This second query replaces the loop with halt. We know the second query won't be solvable in intuitionistic logic because otherwise we'll have a working algorithm solving halting problem. If we put these two queries into our system, the system simply unhalt. However, we can run the intuitionistic encoding of LEM using loop. The intuitionistic encoding of LEM can be considered as putting double negation in the front. Here, we push a negation into the quantifier. Theoretically, we can use halto to replace loop here. 
but this example would take too long for a demo. Finally, we want to emphasize the reason we prefer constructivity here. Ultimately, constructivity makes the proof certificate equipped with computational con content. This transforms proof searching of a logic query into a program synthesis of a specification. This provides another flavor of program synthesis. We end our presentation with a discussion on the future work. Currently, our system only focuses on expressiveness and correctness of the algorithm. It is not efficient at all, and we expect a lot of optimization to be done here. Second, our correctness is ensured by a pen and paper proof, but it's not convincing evidence that our implementation is correct. To approach that, we can either generate proof certificate and come up with a proof checking algorithm, or we should simplify our current complicated implementation. The good thing about proof certificate is that it is helpful for our big picture on the Curry Howard correspondence. To synthesize provably correct program from specification using universal quantifiers and an implication. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you learned something from this talk. Feel free to talk about your questions and comments. Thank you very much.